Essexella asherae is the most abundant fossil coming from the Mason Creek Lagerstadt, which is in the state of Illinois and is more famous for fossils like Tully Monstrum because of its totally bizarre anatomy and everything. I actually have an entire separate video on that if you're interested. But Essexella can make up as much as 42% of all of the fossils found in the Mason Creek Lagerstadt, which means that there's a lot we can try and learn about it because we have a lot of samples of it. And these researchers looked at a lot of those samples to try and figure out what the heck it was, because it's been generally thought of as a jellyfish, which is a type of cnidarian that you're probably really familiar with. Cnidarians have a two-part life cycle, and depending on the organism, the different parts of the life cycle become the main one. So for example, in jellyfish, the main part of the life cycle is the medusa, where essentially they're floating around in the water column, and you know, dome on top, tentacles on the bottom. And they feed just like that. They have the tentacles reaching down and catch prey in the water. When jellyfish reproduce though, they produce polyps on the seafloor. So essentially it's gonna be like a coral reef, which is also a cnidarian. Except in the case of jellyfish, those kind of polyps are going to eventually pop out into the medusas and then they go on and live the rest of their lives. Things like corals and anemones though, they do the reverse. They live mostly as the polyp and then just release the medusas or at least the eugenic material that produces medusas into the water column, and then the young larvae float around in the water for a while before settling down and becoming the polyp again. And again, this polyp then becomes the main stage of life for those organisms. By looking at many, many fossils of Essexella, the researchers were able to find out that it actually wasn't a jellyfish, but it is another cnidarian. And part of this comes from the fact that they were partially eaten by snails in a few cases. Now, the kind of snail in question was actually preserved on the fossil in some of these cases, which means we can kind of know what it is. And in the modern day representatives or relatives of this snail, they'll float up on bubbles through the water column and attach to jellyfish and eat them. But these ones are larger, so they weren't really floating around in the water column. They had to eat something that was already on the ground. But the researchers also looked at the very broad range of preservation types in Essexella, because there's some that are preserved really well, and there's some that are kind of just amorphous blobs, or some that are mostly eaten by snails. So there's a lot of variation in how they were preserved. But the ones that were preserved really well tell us a lot, because there's this kind of regular corrugation and patterning on the body. It's something that's actually really, really similar to many modern day burrowing sea anemones. They also found that another type of fossil from the Mason Creek Lagerstadt is also probably Essexella, just preserved in a different way. It's these kind of little donut shapes. And part of the reason they think this is, well, if Essexella is an anemone, then these donut shapes are the same anemone, but preserved vertically. And so essentially the fossil, while it would have been longer in life, got compressed down into this little donut. And it shows a lot of the same kind of features as far as the general structure of the tentacles around that hole, both in the vertical ones and in the sideways ones that do resemble these burrowing anemones. So it seems like Essexella was a burrowing anemone and that it was really, really common for some reason. Their abundance though also means the researchers were able to look at the overall environment at the locality and understand kind of how this process actually happened and why there's so much variation in the preservation types. Mason Creek about 300 million years ago wasn't the modern day creek that it's named after. Instead, it was a much larger stream running off the early Appalachian Mountains and depositing a ton of sediment into the ocean. This would have made this an almost estuary-like environment where there's some mixing of salt and fresh water. And even many modern day sea anemones can survive in this kind of environment. They do okay in brackish water. Not necessarily fresh water, but brackish they can handle. Unfortunately for these sea anemones though, occasionally there were just giant floods and that would bring in a lot more fresh water, which would kill some of them, causing them to topple over on their sides. Additionally, there's just a lot more water flowing. A lot of them are gonna get transported. And there's also gonna be a lot of mud in that. So some of the ones that don't topple over, they're just gonna get buried and those are gonna become the vertical kind of donut shaped disks that we find. And you can see this kind of compression happening in the diagram where there's those vertical anemones, they get buried by sediment. And then over millions of years, you can see them getting shorter and shorter until they're more flat like a pancake than long like a tube. But again, not all of them were preserved vertically. There were some that toppled over. And some of them that toppled over were preserved pretty close to where they died, meaning that all that sediment coming in could preserve them before they got decayed. Those will be those ones with those kind of corrugations and that really good texturing and occasionally even tentacles preserved, where again, it just 
died and got buried very, very quickly. Some of them, though, did die and get washed further away from shore, and that includes some that got washed far enough away to be partially eaten by these different snails. But it wasn't just one giant inundation of fresh water, it was multiple pulses of fresh water coming down this stream into this estuary, meaning that there was suddenly a lot more mud too, even after the snails had started eating, which is why on some of them we have the snails preserved. They were still feeding and then suddenly new layer of mud just covers them all up. So it's a really cool way where you can see how some of these animals lived and interacted. Even if, you know, these kind of giant pulses aren't super regular, we could expect a lot of this kind of behavior to be pretty consistent no matter what. That also explains a lot of this decay process starting, where some are very just kind of amorphous blobs, there's not as much material there. Meanwhile, some of them are a little bit better preserved, and it's this kind of gradation or spectrum of preservation, where we have a lot of different variation in how well they were preserved. It also potentially explains why we even have fossils of Tolly Monstrum. Tolly Monstrum has generally been thought to have potentially been living in the Mason Creek Fossil Creek, it's not actually named the Mason Creek Fossil Creek, but essentially the stream that led to these rocks being deposited here. And then occasionally when they die, they'd get washed out with all the other sediment and we'd get the fossils of them. If there were these periodic massive floods that did carry a lot of fresh water out to the salt water, that makes some sense because if it was a freshwater animal, it probably wouldn't enjoy the salt very much anyway. So that also explains at least some of how we get some of these really strange fossils preserved in Mason Creek.